when tomorrow becomes today, we're actually much more attracted to the enticing options. And so we don't recognize we'll need a strategy. We'll need a way to resist and to make it actually tempting and fun to do the thing that's good for us and that aligns with our goals. So if we were a little bit more self-aware, I think we'd make better choices and recognize, okay, maybe the most effective workout would burn slightly more calories and make you fit faster, but you're going to quit after one visit to the gym. So it's not the right one to choose. And same with, you know, the course selections for your graduate degree. If you if you take the toughest machine learning class first, you may not persist um, as, as if you take a, you know, a, a graphics class or something. I'm, you know, making it up based on my own interests. But <laughs> graphics design might be even more exciting. Uh, so you have to find the balance. So you're pursuing the goal, but you're doing it in a way that will actually be instantly gratifying. And then this temptation will actually be working for you because you'll find it tempting to do the thing. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Doing creative work can be kind of lonely, and that's why we built the Unmistakable Listener Tribe. The tribe is a community for professionals to connect and support each other. Everything is designed to help you grow your business and share what's working and what isn't. And that's true whether you're a business owner or an artist. You'll get access to feedback, live conversations with guests, and so much more. By joining the tribe, you become part of a community of creators who all support each other, and it's completely free. Hopefully, I'll see you there. Visit unmistakablecreative.com slash tribe to join. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash tribe. Katie, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it is my absolute pleasure to have you. It's funny because I had actually written down your name as somebody that I wanted to interview because I'd come across it some in so many of the other books that I read. And then coincidentally, I got an email from your publicist at our mutual publisher saying that you had a new book out. And uh, it's a book titled How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Wanted to Be. And when I saw the word science, I was like, yes, finally, somebody has done this with actual science, not just, you know, anecdotal nonsense or, you know, um, basically subjective evidence. So I really appreciated that. But before we get into all of that, given the nature of your work, uh, I want to start asking you, what social group were you a part of in high school? And what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made throughout your life and your career? Oh, wow. I love that question. Um, I went to a funny high school. I was actually just talking about this with one of my good friends. It's odd that you asked this question today. Uh, I went to, uh, she was saying, did you go to a sweet 16 high school? And I was like, what does that mean? Um, Or excuse me. She said, did you go to a 16 candles high school? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, like a big high school that had enough people for all the groups. And I went to a small high school. It had only 120 students in the graduating class. And so there actually weren't as, you know, there were small cliques, but we didn't have like the geeks, the jocks. It wasn't quite the same. Um, Uh So I would say if there were categories, there was sort of like a group who uh, was friends with everyone. And that was probably half the class. And then there were a couple yeah. of smaller cliques. And I was kind of in that crew. Um, I was friendly with most people. I edited the yearbook. I played on the tennis team. Uh, I took advanced classes. And so like, you know, some of my friends were athletes. Some of my friends were from yearbook. Some of my friends were from AP math. <laughs> it's a, just it dependent. Yeah. Well, you know, this is something I've, I've asked a lot of people who went to small high schools. What did you learn about navigating human relationships from being in such an intimate environment? Because you're right, for a lot of us, that is not a common high school experience. Like, I couldn't tell you the names of 90% of the people I went to high school with. Like, I probably wouldn't recognize most of them on the street. Right. Whereas I, I think I could probably tell you the names of all of them and I would definitely recognize all of them. Which, but your book editor also comes with that, I should note. Yeah, <laughs> I was, that's I was true. a sentimental high school student, apparently, or else I wouldn't have done that. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a great question. What did I learn? I think uh, one of the things I learned was that, uh, like, ideally, you wouldn't make enemies, especially in such a small environment, right? It was important to try to be kind to everyone because it was just Mm. too small of a place to be gossiping behind one person's back or, you know, it came back to bite you. 
So I would yeah. say that was a key lesson for me. And it's it's not that I've always stuck to it, but that in general, it is really a good approach to try to be nice to everyone and to befriend everyone you can because the world is small. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're a professor at arguably one of the most elite institutions in the world. And I wonder, did your parents, were you encouraged to be incredibly ambitious and, and driven academically? Because that's kind of standard for any Indian kid. Like, you, I'm sure you probably know this, <laughs> given that you teach at UPenn. Like, I'm sure you have your fair share of Indian students. But um, I wonder, you know, like what the narrative about education and school was growing up for you. Yes, I, I wasn't raised by Indian parents, but I think I had the Indian parent experience. So, yeah. um. Yes, my parents were very, very education focused from a young age. I'm an only child. My um, dad's dad was a university professor and his uh, sister and brother are both university professors. He was the oddball who didn't go into the academic <laughs> sphere. Um, my mom's family was more engineers, um, but still a serious, serious academic focus was part of her background. So it was absolutely always something we talked about. I think by the time I was five, I could name many universities, which is a little <laughs> weird in hindsight. <laughs> but, um, I One thing that's a little different, though, I should say, is that I think my parents, they believed in me. They thought, you know, she seems like a smart kid. But they also thought, like, maybe she doesn't seem like, you know, way off the charts, smarter than everybody else and is going to get <laughs> get into the top schools, which is our big ambition for her. So my dad, who was very strategic, had this scheme, like, let's see if she could really thrive in an athletic pursuit that might make it a little easier for her to get into a top school because she had to have that on the side. So my parents really pushed me in tennis, which ended uh -huh. up being a sport I played in college, Division One, And indeed, it, it helped. It definitely helped me uh, get in. And so that was kind of a weird way of a roundabout way of getting <laughs> someone yeah. who you hope would achieve academically. Uh, it's funny, right? To like, I was a jock in the end. That was part of how I got into college, certainly. But then I ended up doing really well in college, much better than I'd done, frankly, in high school. Um, so that was like an accident, maybe because in high school, I was busy playing tennis so much. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, that was my, that was my background is, is unusual, I guess. But um, it's definitely funny, aggressive I I, parents. Yeah, I mean, I think I the only reason I got into Berkeley was because I made all state band as a tuba player. Like I, you know, I look me and my sister look at what it takes to get into Berkeley now. And both of us look at the, the scores that people get. And we're like, yeah, we would have definitely not gotten in if we were applying now. <laughs> I, I feel the same way. So I went to Princeton and um, I, I feel very lucky that I got in. I wasn't a heavily recruited athlete, but I was, you know, going to make the team. So it was enough that it definitely gave me a boost. And my grades were fine. My SAT scores were, you know, good, but not not perfect. Uh, and, and I don't think in this day and age I would have a chance. <laughs> Did your parents encourage you to pursue any particular career path? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, I think they, they encouraged me to pursue something where I'd make a living. I have a half brother who is wonderful and is an artist and had a really tough time making a living. And I think that was something they were nervous about seeing happen again. And so they definitely pushed me to think about careers where I was likely to be able to support myself, e even if there wasn't a miracle. <laughs> So I had, you know, I majored in practical things. And fr frankly, I loved math. So that was actually, it wasn't like a hardship. Um, mm -hmm. But I ended up becoming an engineer. I started as a Bachelor of Arts student thinking I'd do economics. I was not interested in economics at the way it was taught at the undergraduate level. I fell in love in grad school with economics, oddly. But I hated it yeah. so much that I actually dropped out of the Bachelor of Arts program, did a summer of summer school classes so that I could catch up and become an engineer. Um, and my parents liked that because it seemed practical and they were they were supportive of that. But when when I got interested in research, instead of going sort of the consulting or banking route, which were things I was thinking about, uh, they were supportive. I think they they weren't pushing me one direction or another, though. I think they would have been happy to see me take any of those routes. They were all I was going to be able to live a middle class life. And that's I think they wanted me to be happy and self-sufficient. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, so I want to come back to that, but there, there's something I, I couldn't let go that you said. You mentioned that you were an only child with a half brother. And uh, it's funny because, you know, as somebody who has siblings, I can almost always spot an only child. Uh, I, I remember when my sister introduced me to her brother in law, my first question was, Does he have siblings? And she's like, No. And I'm like, Shit, that's a red flag. <laughs> like, um, oh. But but the thing that, that I, I've always found, you know, when I look at my only uh, children friends, like they fall into two categories. Uh, those who treat their friends like, you know, their brothers and sisters. And then the other ones who are selfish, but like in really subtle ways that I, they're completely unaware of stupid things like not showing up on time, making sure, you know, whatever timing you schedule, something centers around them. Uh, you know, I wonder like what the experience of being an only child was like for you in terms of, of you know, forming social relationships. Like, What did that teach you about navigate making your way in the world? Well, that's an interesting question. And I should also clarify. So my half brother is 18 years older than I am, which is part of the reason okay. I feel like an only child. So we never lived under the same roof. Um, so that that I think that qualifies me as the only child in my household. It feels funny to claim I had a sibling um, in the traditional sense, though I certainly have a sibling um, in a very important sense. Um, I, you know, I was lonely a lot as a kid. And I was mentioning, you asked me about what I learned from going to a small high school. And I said, be nice to everyone. I think I, I was so lonely because I am definitely an extrovert that I also learned like, I really crave social interaction. I really like having a best friend <laughs> or a close friend in every setting. Um, and I learned that about myself by being lonely, that it was important to me to always be around people. And, yeah. um, and you know, everybody's different, but that's probably part of the reason I ended up living in a city. And uh, I've always had really close friends in each walk of life. I have really close collaborators in my academic pursuits and always have who I work with repeatedly and who I consider among my best friends. And, and I think that's partly shaped by that desire to have close close connections that I lacked as a kid. Did you know over 90% of podcast listeners take direct action on the advertising they hear? It's smart, right? And smart advertisers know Acast. We power thousands of podcasts all around the world, including the one you're listening to right now. If you want to reach immersed listeners in lots of different creative ways, then Acast's fully curated brand safe marketplace is for you. Visit acast.com slash advertisers to find out more. Acast, for the stories. So this is a different kind of sponsorship, but this episode is actually brought to you by my good friend, Peter Schallard. He's the founder of Commit Action and known as the Shrink for Entrepreneurs. So why is he sponsoring Unmistakable Creative? If you want to be more productive, less stressed, and ultimately happier and more successful, then you need to hear about accountability coaching. Commit Action pairs you with a dedicated coach to act as your second brain, helping you to break down big goals, prioritize, and execute consistently. A lot of the reviews on Trustpilot describe Commit Action as literally life-changing. And as an unmistakable creative listener, you'll get $100 off your first month's coaching when you use Creative 100 at checkout. So if you want to become a productivity powerhouse, then go to www.commitaction.com and give it a try. And if you're curious and you want to hear more of Peter's story, he and I went deep in our recent episode about the psychology of highly productive entrepreneurs that went live on May 3rd. Give it a listen to hear his take on all things entrepreneurial psychology. This episode of The Unmistakable Creative is supported by Command Line Heroes. Command Line Heroes is a podcast that tells the epic true tales of developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels who are revolutionizing the technology landscape. And season seven is available now. This season, Command Line Heroes explores a pivotal year, 1995. It was the start of the dot-com boom, but a lot of things had to come together for the internet to succeed. Meet the internet class of 1995. Did you know that long before you could hop on GoDaddy to grab a domain name, there was a woman you'd have to call? Elizabeth Jake Feinler was the keeper of all domains, and episode one of the season features a conversation with the woman herself, now in her 90s, about how she managed the internet and how her team needed to create the DNS. I got a sneak preview of season seven of Command Line Heroes, and here's what I thought. Depending on how old you are, you might remember a time when the internet wasn't part of our lives and looked nothing like it did today. Or those awful days of dial-up when your parents would be yelling at you to get off the internet so they could use the phone. Command Line Heroes is a fascinating look at the evolution of the internet as we know it today. Command Line Heroes is hosted by developer and podcaster Saran Yabarik. Search for Command Line Heroes anywhere you listen to podcasts, and thanks to Command Line Heroes for their support.
Well, yeah, I can relate. I, you know, I moved around constantly as a kid. I mean, you're a college professor, so you know what that life is like for anybody who's the son of a a non-tenured professor. You know, my dad got his tenure track position when I started high school. So, oh wow. uh, And so I said, it's not a coincidence that I, you know, have made a career out of doing something that ensures I'll never stop meeting new people. (laughs) Yes, that's wonderful. Um, That seems like a really positive aspect of it. It's it's interesting, different things driving that desire for social interaction. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, let's, let's talk about your college experience because, you know, I think something that you said that really struck me was that you realized you hated economics the way and the way it was taught. And it's funny because I had that exact same experience, but, uh, you know, as an economics major at Berkeley, and I remember, I think it was my final semester, you know, I was a super senior. So I graduated in four and a half years and I was sitting, listening to this professor talk about how to uh, use a utility function to maximize the amount of milk you could get out of a cow and thinking to myself, <laughs> when the hell am I ever going to need to know how to do this? Um, no, you you do realize is, you're interviewing a milkman right now. So I just yeah. have to say is, <laughs> that might have appealed to me slightly more. Yeah. Well, so but the thing is that I, the real question from that is you figured that out so early in college. And I feel like so many people don't. They just kind of leave wondering. I, I felt like I wasted the experience of Berkeley when I, I've read books by other people who went to Berkeley and I feel like they're describing a different university. And so, you know, as somebody who is a teacher in an institution like this, like, what is it that prevents people from discovering this thing that they were meant to do? And and then how is it that, you know, I know you write about conformity, which we will get into, but I often felt like Berkeley was a breeding ground for conformity because everybody there was like future bankers, lawyers, and, you know, UPenn students and investment bank do- and doctors. That's funny that Berkeley seems I'm like, wow, if Berkeley was a place that breeds conformity, what what would you say about all the institutions I've been affiliated with? Um, okay, sorry, let me back up. That was a long question with lots of parts. Of, yeah. like, <laughs> give me the part. Well, like, what is it about? G- give me yeah, the key part you want I me guess, to talk about. Okay, so let, let, let's start with this. Like, you know, you figured out really early on that you hated economics and you did something to change it. Yeah. I just accepted my fate and kept going until I ended up with a degree in environmental economics, which I'll never use. Got it. Okay, so like, what what is it that helps students find... Yeah. The right path in college. Is that the question? That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, like everything else, I think luck certainly plays a big role, right? Or do you talk to the right people at the right moment to be inspired? For me, the luck was that I had a roommate my freshman year who was an engineer, and I was sort of looking at her and the classes she was taking and the courses she was considering signing up for as electives. And I was like, wow, those are really interesting classes. You're taking a class about e-commerce, class about the design of transportation systems. Like, that sounds fascinating. I want to study those things. And uh, and on the flip side, I wasn't enjoying the economics track that I thought I would go on because I was, I liked math and I wanted to do something practical. So economics seemed natural. But then I took this first year course that was just mind numbing. And, you know, you described the experience, but the professor in this class, who, by the way, was never again, he, he taught, I'm not going to say who it was, you've heard of him. He was allowed to teach this class one time, introductory microeconomics, and never again, because it was such a disaster. But he would walk <laughs> into class and read from a textbook. Literally, that was the lecture. I mean, I can't even imagine doing that to my students. It's outrageous. And it was terrible. Uh, not only that, it was a textbook he was in the process of writing, and it was not yet complete. <laughs> so he would read like these drafts that had errors in them, and then he'd send us the draft so we'd have reading. But the reading would come like two weeks after he'd covered the material in class because he wasn't quite on top of finishing it. And there were errors. Like I remember doing a midterm problem, and I did it the way that it was outlined in the book. And then they were like, oh, no, sorry, that's wrong. And there was an error in the book. <laughs> like what? <laughs> so anyway, not only was it hor- it was horribly taught, the material didn't speak to me because I was like this is not how people really make decisions. All this optimizing baloney and um it just I was like that's not have have you met my roommates? Like we're a mess. This is not this is not what human decision making looks like. Um so those two things like the hatred of <laughs> the path I thought I was meant to be on and the luck of having a roommate who was majoring in something that was closely related you know, different enough that I could see a new path by looking over her shoulder. That's what lucked me into it. And and then in general, like, I think there's a huge amount of luck, but I don't think we explore enough. And that's true in life. 
certainly true in college. People come in with too many preconceived notions about what they expect to be, even though they're 18. And this is the time to, you know, take a class in, um, you know, French literature and a class in, um, you know, astrophysics and a class in accounting and like see what speaks to you. And that exploration yeah. is how we, you know, you can make your own luck. And I, I got lucky by having a roommate who did some of the exploring for me. But I, I think I'm always excited to see students who are really going broad in their first year because I think they have more opportunity then naturally to find the thing that makes their heart sing. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, when I had Tina Seelig here from Stanford, she was telling me that, you know, she has two categories of students, you know, these people who come in at 18 and have their whole life planned out when they've only lived a fraction of it. And the others who are worried that they haven't found some sort of passion. And she said, it's actually (laughs) the second category of students that ends up being more successful in the long run. And, you know, I wonder, you know, what you see in terms of trends with your your own students when it comes to this. That's the, the first piece of this. But, you know, you're a graduate of one of the most elite institutions in the world. You're a professor at one of the most elite institutions in the world. So in the wake of you seeing something like the college admission scandal, which is the second question, mm. where, what do you what do you think of, of our education system today? I mean, you and I were both talking about the fact we wouldn't have been accepted into the schools. But I remember watching the there was a documentary on Netflix about this whole thing. And to see, you know, these kids, you know, looking at their computers to see whether they got into their school of choice or not. It was just this either moment of profound anxiety or profound joy. And I remember thinking that was nothing like the experience I got. I opened the envelope and thought, cool, I got into Berkeley. Mm, even with your Indian parents. <laughs> like, I totally I had, mean, I totally to had that, the experience. I'm like, oh, well, my God, my life is this is amazing. When I got, well, to them, it was just like, this is what we expected. So, no, oh, there's no funny. celebration for your good grades. Nobody's putting your report cards on refrigerators or any of that bullshit. Like, this is what we expect of you. That's great. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's great. It's fascinating. In my house, it was definitely sort of what you see today. Like, we were so, all of us, overjoyed at my good fortune, because I do not think any of us thought it was even close to a sure thing that I would end up at a school like Princeton. So I, I remember that feeling of absolute elation when I got the news. I, like, truly over the moon. Um, okay, so, but let me say a little bit more about... I think your more fundamental question, which was like, what do I think about the whole college admission scene? Yeah, I, I think that it's actually getting better, even though your narrative was that it's getting worse. And here's how I think it's getting better. I think um, when I was in school, the fraction of kids who are from low socioeconomic status backgrounds was vanishingly small. There were very few kids on Pell Grants. You know, not everyone was a a billionaire's kid, but most kids had come from a pretty comfortable middle class background with parents who could afford to pay at least some of their tuition. And that's just not how I think a meritocracy should operate. And it's really changed a lot. And I think, um, at least in, at the Ivies, which is where I'm, where I've spent my career, it's been wonderful to see the the move from um, having kids have, you know, debt when they graduated to a completely grant-based system of providing financial support for kids at at the top schools. It's amazing uh, to see the enormous effort that's been made to increase the percentage of students on Pell Grants at places like Princeton and Harvard and Penn, where I work. And it's been transformative. And they're different places and they're better places because they're serving, I think, the function they should in society, which is to try to create, I know we'll never have a truly level playing field, at least in my lifetime, but the more we can do to get towards one, the better. And I do think these institutions were not serving that function even 20 years ago, and they're coming a lot closer now. Yeah. Well, you know, I I wonder, because for a lot of kids in high school these days, if they don't get into, say, one of these schools, it's basically, I'm not going to amount to a damn thing in this life now because I didn't get this degree from this prestigious school. And then you couple that with the fact that we have this massive student loan debt crisis. So, I wonder, you know, as somebody who is teaching at one of the most elite institutions in the world, if you were given the task of redesigning the education system from the ground up so that we don't leave people behind, because the reality is that, you know, you go to a school like UPenn or Berkeley, you have doors that are open to you that are not open to other people. And I learned this because I went to a grad school that was far less 
you know, known than Berkeley. Like I ended up at Pepperdine for my MBA program. And I remember one of my friends saying, you feel like a genius, don't you? He said, you're not. You're surrounded by idiots. That's the difference between being here and being at Berkeley. Uh, which, you know, that was a, a, you know, not the nicest way to say it, but there was a grain of truth to the contrast between the people in each of those environments. So given, you know, if you had to redesign this from the ground up, how would you do it? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. Um, I, I would, I would pump more money to public institutions like Berkeley, frankly, and Penn State and the University of Virginia. I, and I, I think investing in those public institutions. So we have really, and we already have a pretty excellent public institution system in the United States, but I think it should be even stronger. And ideally, every state's public school would be considered on par with an Ivy League degree. Um, because that's, you know, not everyone's comfortable getting on a plane and moving across the country from their family, and they shouldn't have to, to get an absolutely outstanding education. And in many states, they don't, but there are some states that aren't on par. And I think, you know, investing there would be a great use of dollars. Yeah. Um, I... I'm not, I'm not an education the, policy expert, so yeah, maybe no, I'll no, stop I'm there. Not, that that no, would be no, mine, but guess, that's like my one. That's the one thing so, that comes to mind. Okay, so let, instead of policy, let's talk about curriculum. Uh, you know, like if you, I mean, I, clearly, I think the nature of of what people like you and people like Adam Grant teachers is incredibly practical because I've I've read all of Adam's books. He's been a guest here before, and yet I feel like I never got the experience of having people like you or Adam as teachers. What you know, and I, I've seen some of the students that come out of your classes, like they accomplish extraordinary things. They do. It's amazing. I mean, our role is very, you know, now I'm going to like mention Ben Franklin, who I love. <laughs> I obviously don't know Ben Franklin, but I would have loved to. I'm a big admirer. Uh, his vision of a university was that it should be a place that taught a tremendous amount of practical knowledge. And he founded Penn, which is where I work. Um, and and there's a lot of applied knowledge generated at Penn. It sort of revolves more around the uh, having an undergraduate business program and and the world's oldest. It didn't exist when Ben Franklin was there, but it's certainly in in the vein of something he would have approved of. Uh, you know, a, a big engineering focus, a giant med school, um, a dental school, a, a veterinary school, a nursing school, like very applied. And that's in contrast to a place like Princeton, which is where I went as an undergraduate, which is very much um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, more sort of focused on theory and, um, you know, teaching you classics and so on. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in both. And it probably depends on the student, really, what's what's best. Um, I got a ton out of that broad undergraduate experience. But I think some people love practical knowledge. That's part of what I, I love it enough that I was drawn to engineering as part of my experience. I did, you know, I was an American studies minor. So I also got to use the humanist part of my brain. But I, I don't think we should throw out the window theoretical math and and Econ 101 and things of that nature yeah. and suddenly replace them with the kinds of classes that Adam and I teach at Wharton where we're teaching you how to be a leader, how to work with people, how to make unbiased decisions. I think those are electives that I would love to see available in undergraduate curricula. And, and they are in a lot of places, like a lot of psychology and economics departments will offer things of that nature. And I think it's great that there are some undergraduate business degree programs. And I think Wharton does a great job educating its students in places that, you know, there are lots of other wonderful such institutions, but it is very, you really have to know you want to go into business before we were yeah. just mentioning the kind, there's sort of two kinds of students, the kinds of students who show up at Wharton are careerist. I don't think we want to move towards a system where every 18 year old knows they want to be an investment banker or a consultant or, or an entrepreneur. I think it's good that most 18-year-olds are sort of like, I want to be something when I grow up. <laughs> and then they end up at a more broad liberal arts college and figure that out. And then for the unusual kids who are certain they want to be business students, having that more applied degree available at places like Wharton, so a subset of them choose to do that, that's great. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. But I do not think we want to shift all of undergraduate education so that everyone has to take leadership, for instance. Yeah. I, think it, I think it's well suited to some, not all. 
Okay. Well, one last question, which I think will make a, a perfect segue into the the content of the book. What do your students worry about? Like, what are their sort of existential concerns? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, <laughs> right now? <laughs> like, what are they not? You know, they worry about public health. Yeah. They worry about the economy. They worry about their parents and whether their parents are going to get a vaccine. Um, they worry about whether they'll be able to get jobs and whether work will be remote or in person and what that will look (laughs) like. Uh, You know, right now there's a lot of existential crises related to the last year's calamity um, on everyone's mind in my classes. And there's a lot of worries about polarization and, and fake news and, and the direction of our democracy, racism. Um, those are the kinds of existential crises they're having. And frankly, it's great. They should be having those existential crises. Yeah. I think they're worried about all the right things. Um, well, it's funny. I would never think, you know, a group of MBA students from UPenn would be worried about how to find a job. Like I'd think, oh, of all the people in the world who are pretty much guaranteed any job they want, these guys would be at the top of the list. Well, they're all guaranteed jobs, but maybe not their dream job. I mean, and, and not quite guaranteed, but, you know, if they're willing to take a job, but yeah. they come in with the aspiration to... Um, do something more meaningful than they've they've left behind for the most part. I mean, a lot of students coming to an MBA program, it sounds like <laughs> you might be included in this. I'm curious if this was your experience. But, you know, a lot of them, they've done something for the last few years and they don't want to just be in that same job for the rest of their lives. And that's what causes them to step back and say, OK, I'm going to go for a, another degree. And that's a chance to pivot, explore, maybe do the exploration I didn't do as an undergraduate to figure out what's out there, experiment yeah. and then find my passion. And it's a little harder to do that in a crummy economy because not every door is open to you in a way that it might have been um, in a in a boom time. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I mean, it, it's funny because I was talking to a group of Columbia MBA students the other day. Uh, one of our, our guests here was a professor there. And, you know, I thought it was like, oh, this is great. I get to go and speak to students at a business school that rejected me. Talk about vin- being vindicated. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I, I think that there's definitely some truth to that because I, I did graduate into a crummy economy from business school. It was April 2009. And you mentioned, you know, those doors not being open. And I remember, you know, the thing I shared with students, I said, look, you know, the thing that is beautiful about those doors not being open is you start to realize how often the opportunities in front of you uh, blind you to the possibilities that surround you. And, you know, for me, that was largely what happened. So how so it was largely what happened? Say more. Well, I mean, so one, I, you know, my job history is checkered to say the least because I've been fired from every job I had. So I knew that, you know, that wasn't going to happen um, and nobody was hiring. And so I literally I'd started a blog as a way to get the job to, to stand out in the job market. I had no idea that it would actually end up just becoming my job and all of this would follow. Um, mm. But it was I think the best advice I ever got during that period was from a consultant who told me he's the worst thing you can do when you're unemployed is to spend all of your time looking for a job. And that sounded so counterintuitive. And now 10 years later, I realized that was priceless advice. Uh, it's because like make I your did... own way instead. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mm-hmm. think that that makes a perfect segue to getting the content of the book. Uh, so I'm curious, like of all the subjects that you could, you know, write a book about how you landed on this and, you know, how, you know, you, to me, you're this combination of a social scientist and engineer. And I, I think that's why I like the book so much is that you basically took principles of engineering and applied them to this book. But, um, you know, what is it that prompted you to write this book of all the ones you could write? Oh, wow. Um, well, there was no other book I could write. I'll be honest. Like, this is my life's work. So so in a sense, it was the obvious book. It's just funny to me that um, I will say probably for a decade, I knew I wanted to write a book about something. Eventually, mm-hmm. a lot of people in business academia eventually write a book. And I thought that sounds neat because I'd like to communicate with a broader audience. I like the idea of sharing science broadly. In fact, I remember we're talking about college. I remember at Princeton as a senior, I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up yet. I had no idea, but I knew I loved science and I knew I loved communicating about it. And I took an advanced journalism class where everyone else wanted to be a journalist. And I was very clear in my application for the class and in my conversations with our instructor, like, no, I I don't want to be a journalist. I just want to write really well, as well as a journalist, about science. Mm -hmm. Um, So I always knew I wanted to write a book, but I didn't know what it would be about, which in hindsight is hilarious because there there was only one book I'm qualified to write, and this is the one. Uh, But 
But it took me a while to see the big picture and the way all of my work fit into this bucket of changing behavior for the better in durable ways. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I started in graduate school, my PhD is in computer science and business. And I didn't know what field really I was going to be in because those are two fields. They're not a field. Uh, It wasn't until I discovered behavioral economics about halfway through my first year, accidentally, frankly, it was just sort of mentioned in a lecture in a class I was required to take. And then I started down a rabbit hole and fell in love. And my early work was not as programmatic. It was like, I liked big data. Let's see if I could do something cool with this data set and find something quirky about human nature. And it wasn't until I got to Penn, where we have a a giant medical school that exerts a really strong influence on the whole university in a good way, uh, and has a lot of folks who are doing behavioral economics and health. And so I just started Mm. hanging out with this group because there were a bunch of world-class people there thinking about related problems. And I learned a couple years in just how big of a deal it is that people don't make optimal decisions when it comes to health. And specifically, there was this graph I saw at a presentation, and the graph showed that 40% of premature deaths are due to behaviors that could be changed. And it it was Mm. like my head almost exploded at that very moment. Like, what, 40%? I would have said 4%. So things like, you know, not eating right, not exercising sufficiently, uh, not getting your recommended cancer screenings or taking your meds or um, buckling your seatbelt, all of those bad decisions can yeah. they add up uh, drinking, smoking, uh, all, they add up to 40 percent of premature death. So that was like a pivot moment for me when I realized I should be focused not on like cute, interesting things I could do with big data, but like fixing that. You know, I'm not going to get rid of the 40 percent, but like making a dent in it. Let, what? Could, how could I help? This is a real opportunity to do something good with my skills. And so mm-hmm. I started focusing a lot more on behavior change that's positive. And that's what this book is about, like. It's not about health decisions specifically, because I also ended up studying savings decisions and decisions about education and productivity at work. But uh, but that I'll say North Star of like wanting to make a dent in a really important problem of behavior change and realizing it could make the world better and people's lives better. That's what guided this book. Hey, podcaster, meet Acast. We're the top independent podcast network for creators in the know. We empower you to develop your podcast idea, find your audience, and grow listener relationships, wherever those listeners are. You'll also find a whole range of ways to make money, from membership plans for paying fans to our fully curated and creative advertising experience. Visit acast.com slash network to find out more. Acast, for the stories. So have you ever downloaded a file to your computer and drove yourself insane trying to find it? It's a bit like tearing your whole house apart to find your keys, only to realize they were in your pocket, except you never actually find the files. I don't know about you, but this not only drives me crazy, but it causes me to waste a ton of time. No matter how many Dropbox folders you set up or how you organize your files, somehow the system just falls apart. You kill your productivity just looking for stuff. So a few weeks ago, I learned about a new tool that helps you organize everything in one place and find the content you need 10 times faster. It's called charlie.ai, and it automates your ability to organize files and find them. And now I use it for everything from storing invoices to contracts, and I can find whatever I'm looking for in seconds. And in the spirit of transparency, I love this product so much that I asked the marketing director at Charlie if she'd bring me on as an advisor. Charlie.ai is like a real life assistant for your content, but with the power of AI. And you can try it for free at charlie.ai slash podcast. Again, that's charlie spelled C-H-A-R-L-I dot A-I slash podcast. This episode of The Unmistakable Creative is supported by RemoteWorks, a podcast that tells extraordinary stories of teams that made the shift to flexible working. If there's anything that last year taught us, it's that the way we work has changed forever. And in each episode of RemoteWorks, host Melanie Green tells an insightful story about how people and companies are adapting. She talks about the very problems that all of us are dealing with. Last season, in Preventing Burnout, people learned about the challenges and rewards of working remotely during the pandemic. Now, I don't know about you, but I have definitely felt that there are days when I am burned out, and sometimes I don't even know when I'm done working because it's all I do. A recent study found that 75% of workers have experienced burnout, and 40% said their burnout was a direct result of the pandemic. But what if we don't know the signs of impending burnout? You'll hear firsthand from someone who has been through burnout, as well as get expert advice on how to recognize it and what you can do to prevent it from happening. 
In this season, Remote Works explores several other topics related to the new world of work. For those of you who are baseball fans that are missing those days of eating overpriced hot dogs and drinking oversized beers, they pull back the curtain at Major League Baseball for a glimpse of how America's most beloved pastime is working remotely. You'll hear how the MLB has had to adjust just about everything that they do, from new rules about how we gather to virtual fans and stadium. You'll get to look at how they've embraced this new world of flexible work. I recently listened to the burnout episode of the Remote Works podcast, and here's what I thought. Melanie does an amazing job bringing in diverse perspectives from experts and people who are dealing with the issues these experts are trying to solve. It's basically a combination of great storytelling with practical advice that you can apply to your life or your work. So search for Remote Works anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thanks to Remote Works for their support. Mm. Well, I mean, you open the book by saying that widely touted techniques don't always help you or others change. You forget to take your medication again in spite of downloading that goal setting app to help. You procrastinate on that big quarterly report for your boss in spite of setting daily reminders to work on it. Your employees don't take advantage of company sponsored educational programs or retirement benefits, even when they're offered rewards for signing up. And, you know, your book, like I said, I think part of why I liked it so much was your book falls into the self help category, but you also poke holes into you know, what are widely touted platitudes in most self-help books? Because I feel like people make so much effort to change that doesn't lead to any change at all, despite, you know, the the stack of books on their shelves. Like I've joked that, you know, if I, my life were an accurate reflection of the people I've interviewed and the books that I read, I would be a billionaire <laughs> with six pack abs and a harem of supermodels, you know, on speed dial. And I'm none of those things. So, why is it, I guess, really, the question is that we make all this effort to change, you know, by reading all these books, by going to these seminars, and nothing changes. You know, I've, I've asked numerous people this question. Stephen Kotler gave me one version. But I'm curious, from your perspective, and based on your research, what is it that leads to all this personal development that actually leads to no change? Well, there's a lot of answers, not just one. Um, the first one is, the change is really freaking hard. And and I hope that in reading my book, no one comes away thinking like, oh, now I've read it. I know what to do. You know, like uh, I have a guaranteed success program <laughs> because unfortunately I can't offer that, nor can anyone else. I'm just offering science that should increase the probability that change is successful. Um, but But it's really hard because there's all these things working against us. Human nature is generally working against change. We're very inertial. We uh, overweight instant gratification dramatically relative to long-term rewards. We're forgetful. We're overcommitted. <laughs> we, we, you know, um, there's just, there's a lot of things working against us. So change is difficult. So that's the first answer. Even if yeah. everyone had the best science in the world, like the best coach in the world whispering in their ear, many still probably wouldn't succeed because there is a lot working against you. And I also think that's important to acknowledge before starting a journey because you want to build in an expectation that there will be setbacks and that it's not going to be the smoothest ride. Um, okay. So the, the set, cause otherwise you'll, you know, like you'll collapse when you hit the first one and then you won't make it. Um, yeah. So, so that's part one. And then I guess part two, and this is where like, I hope my book really adds more value than just saying, cause it's hard, uh, is I do, I, I do really believe that there's too much of a one size fits all. Like, I don't know what your problem is, but I'm going to solve it. <laughs> approach right. in all yeah. of these books. Like I have my technique. Listen, I've got this goal setting strategy that, you know, I've perfected or uh, here are my seven tips. And and most of it uh, doesn't reflect an understanding of what's preventing change in the first place, which is very personal. And it really depends on the kind of change. Like, are you trying to build an exercise routine? Are you trying to um, save more? Do you want to go back to school? And what's holding you back? Is it uh, is it the people who surround you who aren't supporting you? Is it uh, that you just, you know, like are really incredibly forgetful and you just like can't prioritize this over everything else because you can't keep track of it? Is it that yeah. you're really fundamentally impulsive? Like what is what is the barrier? And then the solution depends. So the best strategies that I've seen in science are really sensitive to the context and and recognize like if I want to get someone to get a flu shot, or a vaccine for COVID, the the strategy to use is really different than if I want to help them build an exercise habit. Like those are just fundamentally different problems. There's fundamentally different barriers. And I think yeah. too much of self-help is like a person with a single idea uh, mm -hmm. or a, a few ideas without a recognition that it, it depends which which is the right one to use in which context. And I try to add that with my book. 
Yeah, it's funny you mentioned context because I feel like I've been just beating this like a dead horse on the show. You know, like we had Sam Summers here who wrote a book about context. Uh, I think he's a professor, if I remember correctly, at uh, Tufts. And, you know, we have this membership group where, I, you know, I, I work with creatives to help them make their ideas happen. And one thing I frequently say to them is I want you to consider the possibility that everything I've told you is bullshit because it <laughs> might actually be for you. Um, yeah. And I always have to offer that caveat. But you know, you start the first chapter with this idea of getting started. And you say, if you want to change your behavior or someone else's, you're at a huge advantage if you begin with a blank slate or fresh start and no old habits working against you. And then you say New Year's, for instance, typically exerts a far greater influence on behavior than, say, your typical Monday. The bigger the landmark, the more likely it is to help us take a step back and regroup and make a clean break from the past. Yet people don't stick to their New Year's resolutions all the time. So how do you resolve that paradox? I actually don't think it's a paradox at all. And it's actually, okay. I think, fundamental to what I'm trying to do in the book, which is explain there are different challenges at different points. And the challenge of getting started is what New Year's can motivate, but it doesn't get you yeah. to the finish line. And then once you've got the motivation to begin to write to say, OK, here's my goal. This is what I want to accomplish. And I'm going to actually exert some effort towards that. That's what you get when you have these moments that I call fresh starts. Uh, that make you feel like you're opening a, ch a new chapter in your life and you sort of step back, think big picture. What are my goals? How am I going to do better in this new job that I've just started than in the old one? How am I going to make my life happier in California than it was in um, Pennsylvania when you move cross country? You know, whatever that is, or this this year than last year, those landmarks, they they cause us to have this spike in motivation. So we'll start but they do nothing to help us succeed. They just get mm. us going. And so that's what the rest of the book is about. Yeah. <laughs> okay, like it's, you've got the you've got the kickstart, but like you're okay. going to need more than just a resolution to get somewhere. Yeah. Well, okay, so that makes the perfect segue to talking about impulsivity, right? You say lots of research shows that we tend to be overconfident about how easy it is to be self-disciplined. This is why so many of us optimistically buy expensive gym memberships when paying per visit fees would be cheaper, register for online classes we'll never complete, and purchase family-sized chips on discount to trim our monthly snack budget only to consume every last crumb in a single sitting. We think future me will be able to make good choices, but too often present me succumbs to temptation. And, you know, it's funny because I've seen this in myself. I've seen it in people who sign up for the courses that I teach, uh, you know, like the amount of hobbies and things that I've quit over the years uh, is insane. Like, you know, Muay Thai kickboxing, learning to play the electric bass, capoeira, just to name a few. Like I, I had an old roommate that I lived with who thought, you know, I will never stick to anything. And then funny enough, 10 years later, he was asking me for advice on how to stick to something. Um, so. I feel like this happens so often to people where they basically don't remove the shrink wrap. Dan Kennedy, the copywriter, said, he said, if I worried about the people you know, who you know don't remove the shrink wrap on my courses, I'd be broke. Uh, but how do people that don't remove the shrink wrap become people who actually follow through on this and not give in to their impulsivity? I want to think about that for a second. So how do people who don't remove the shrink wrap... So when you characterize someone as not removing the shrink wrap, I'm thinking of someone like who doesn't read the book. But I think that's not what you mean. I think. I'm yeah, not I mean, the it's question. the person. Yeah, sorry. So it, it literally it's the people that you described in the quote that I just said, you know, the ones who sign up for online courses ah. that they don't complete that kind so of how, stuff. So like, like, how do they how do they change it? You're just saying, like, what's, yeah. what's the solution to impulsivity? OK, exactly. I'm sorry for being sorry. No worries. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, I don't know if someone doesn't read my book and they don't they don't learn any of these things. How will they go? OK, all right. I mean, let me start again here then. Um. That's a really good question. And I think, you know, the the answer that I offer in the book, and it's the best answer I've got, is that too often we fail to appreciate this challenge of impulsivity. And so we just sort of grit our teeth and say, I'm going to push through. I'm going to do whatever it is I said I was going to do. I'm going to push through in the most effective way possible. But there's this wonderful research by Ayelet Fishbach from the University of Chicago and Caitlin Woolley at Cornell showing that that's actually a mistake. That if instead of saying, I'm going to tackle this goal using like, you know, full self-control mode in the toughest, most effective way possible, we say, I'm going to look for a way to make this goal fun. We persist longer. So for instance, they've done research showing that if somebody is going to the gym and you tell them, you know, look for the most fun workout you can find, uh, they end up persisting longer than someone going to the gym who you say, look for the most effective way to achieve your goals at the gym because they enjoy yeah. it. And we make this mistake because when we're contemplating our goals and how we're going to pursue them, and by the way, they've shown this in other settings too, with studying, with 
eating. It's not just exercise, but I think that's an intuitive example. And and the mistake we make is we're like contemplating this from a moment uh, of, you know, quiet in our home, thinking about our goals. And we think like, yeah, no problem. Tomorrow I'm going to be able to do this. I'll push through. But when tomorrow becomes today, we're actually much more attracted to the enticing options. And so we don't recognize we'll need a strategy. We'll need a way to resist and to make it actually tempting and fun to do the thing that's good for us and that aligns with our goals. So if we were a little bit more self-aware, I think we'd make better choices and recognize, okay, maybe the most effective workout would burn slightly more calories and make you fit faster, but you're going to quit after one visit to the gym. So it's not the right one to choose. And same with, you know, the course selections for your graduate degree. If you if you take the toughest machine learning class first, you may not persist um, as, as if you take a, you know, a, a graphics class or something. I'm, you know, making it up based on my own interests. Yeah. <laughs> graphics design might be even more exciting. Uh, so you have to find the balance. So you're pursuing the goal, but you're doing it in a way that will actually be instantly gratifying. And then per- this temptation will actually be working for you because you'll find it tempting to do the thing. Um, and I've also studied a technique I call temptation bundling. I actually mm-hmm. studied it before I, uh, I yell it and Caitlin did this work that I admire so much on the importance of making it fun. And fundamentally, it has the same insight at its core. I just didn't appreciate it. Um, the idea of temptation bundling was, why don't we solve or literally an engineer a solution to this problem by linking something tempting with whatever it is that we know we should be doing more? So if you should be hitting the books, uh, what if you and you, you know, crave Frappuccinos, what if you only let yourself pick up a Frappuccino on the way to the library? Or if you love lowbrow yeah. TV, um, only let yourself watch your favorite lowbrow <laughs> show while you're at the gym or while you're doing household chores. And and like if you do those, if you create those links, that's another way to make what's good for you fun yeah. and tempting in the moment. So temptation is working for you, not against you. Yeah, it's funny you brought up exercise of all things, because like I was definitely not somebody who exercises. Then I started surfing and snowboarding and I fell in love with both of them. And I don't do either of those things for the exercise. They're just right. the exercise is a convenient fringe benefit of those things. Exactly. That's exactly right. And um, and if you can find the things that make it fun to achieve your goals and it ceases to be the case that you're like pushing towards the goal and having to you know push against a wall. Instead, this is just like a thing you enjoy doing. Yeah. So let's talk uh, about this idea of commitment devices and procrastination. You know, you say commitment devices are tremendously useful. And given how many of us struggle to achieve our goals, you'd think the demand would be high sky. The self-help industry is estimated to be a $10 billion per year market. Clearly, people want help meeting their biggest, most challenging goals that frequently take a pass on these enormously effective tools. And, you know, I think the place that I see this most is when it comes to digital distractions, because this is like the primary issue Mm. many of my readers deal with, where it's like there's every tool imaginable that we've made. Uh, you know, you could read every Cal Newport book under the sun and somehow people still struggle with this. Yes, no, absolutely. It's um, people do not like handcuffing themselves, right? And like saying, oh, literally, I'm going to shut down my screen time by downloading this this commitment device app that will kick me off the internet after this X minutes of use or um, not let me use Twitter after X minutes of use. But um, but there are all these solutions. So like, why, you know, I do think it's a puzzle to some extent, why people won't take them up. And I think the answer, you know, there's there's multiple answers. One is like, we want to believe that we can just grit grit our teeth and get through it sort of related to the the mistake of not making things fun and trying to pursue them the most effective way possible. We just, we want to believe we can. And so when we need to use a tool or a tactic to sort of trick ourselves or set ourselves up for success, often it's, you know, it can be a little bit disappoint. We like feel disappointment in ourselves that we can't just grit our teeth and do it. But I actually think we need to normalize that like failure is normal, that change is hard. And if you expect it and you plan for it, that is really excellent. That's better than being gritty and sort of pushing through. The grittiest people actually, and I'm now very deliberately using a term that my friend and co-author Angela Duckworth coined and has studied in her career, the people who appear to have the most self-control and the most grit are actually people who have systems in place that Mm -hmm. take that challenge off their plate. You know, people who have habits, for instance, as opposed to are deliberately thinking and consciously resisting temptation. Those are the ones who really look self-controlled, but it's really systems that make people look so effective. It's not it's not that there are these magic people (laughs) who just can push through anything. 
So I, I, I think we need a little bit more normalization of you should use crutches. That's the solution. It's not a sign yeah. of weakness. Well, so, um, you know, I, I don't want to go too much into the whole forgetting idea just in the interest of time, but I, I do want to go into two things that you talked about, which are laziness and conformity. And it, I think that what I loved, you know, I've talked to numerous people who have talked about habits, you know, James Clear has been a guest here. Uh, but I think the thing that struck me most uh, in your section on habits, which literally, in, you know, may, inspired me to think of a, a blog post titled, if the lazier you are, the more you'll benefit for habit from, you know, consistent habits. Uh, you say that laziness can be an asset and not just when it comes to, uh, you know, habits. when laziness appropriately harnessed, it can actually help facilitate change. You know, and the funny thing is, there's such a negative connotation to laziness, but you just reframed it in this way. So uh, tell me, you know, let's say somebody, you know, who's listening to this is like, great, I'm lazy. How can I turn that into an asset? <laughs> well, there's two ways. Um, one is uh, by thinking about what are sort of the defaults in your life, um, the default settings, like, you know, what, what's in your fridge? Uh, so you don't have to like, you know, walk outside to go get this, get a snack. If you're thinking about healthy food, you know, like, do you have the ability to exercise at home? Do you have a productive workspace where you can be undistracted and get things done? So like, can you basically set up, uh, your space and your environment with good defaults? Do you have, um, yourself set up for auto deductions from every paycheck to your retirement account? Do you have, uh, all your subscriptions turned off for things that you don't want to be paying money for. So you can sort of take even a, just a, a moment of inspiration, a moment of feeling motivated to make sure your defaults are all right. And then if you're lazy, you won't lift a finger and you're going to eat the healthy things in your in your <laughs> fridge because you're going to be too lazy to go and get takeout. And yep. you're going to, you know, you're going to, uh, if your homepage is, the New York Times instead of Facebook, you're maybe going to be too lazy to go find your way to social media. Uh, if you've got if you've got a productive, quiet workspace set up, you may you may use it more. So so that's one way is just through default. Sort of what can you set up your default space, and then the path of least resistance will be to to live a life that's um, a bit more uh, self controlled. Yeah. And then the second is through habit. So habits are basically an autopilot. Uh, they're not literally a default setting like on switch on your computer, but they're basically the default you fall back on. So you can do things to engineer the building of habits that you will then once you've put in a little bit of effort for, you know, as little as a few weeks to develop them, they just become your go to and autopilot takes over and you can again fall back on that laziness and do this, you know, have the same breakfast you had every other day and the same walk to work and the same sort of like two hours blocked in the morning for writing time and the same check-in with your mentor. Like it, once you structure your life around the habits that you want to be your fallback strategy, it's really easy to be lazy and let autopilot take you in good places. Yeah, I, I would say I'm one of the laziest people around and somehow, but it's literally exactly what you're talking about that allows me to do anything that I do. Uh, so there's something you said about giving advice. And the reason this struck me is, you know, the joke at, at you know, amongst our listeners is that every single person Srini interviews is a reflection of a problem he's trying to solve in his life. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you, and, you know, you say that it's common to give out advice when we see something, someone struggling to achieve a goal. We often think guidance is just the thing they're looking for, whether they ask for it or not. And I feel like if you have a public presence of any sort or, you know, you're on the Internet in any way, you're pretty much the constant target of unsolicited advice. Uh, so what is the deal with that? And it, cause I, I've had friends who are life coaches when, you know, I going through a breakup and I'm like, you know, like literally crying and, you know, they're trying to give me their self-improvement solutions. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want your damn solutions. I just want you to listen to me whine and be my friend. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we're all, it, it's, a, it comes from a good place, right? Like we yeah. all think like, I must have unique insights that you don't have that I can help you with. Um, and that's that's just human nature to believe that we have, um, you know, more knowledge that's helpful to other people than we probably do more insight into their problems and their unique circumstances than we probably do. So it comes from a good place of wanting to provide value, but it has this pernicious downside that I think we don't appreciate enough. And and that is that it busts confidence when you tell somebody hey, like, I know how to do this, and you must not. It, you're basically telling them you're clueless, and I'm smarter than you. <laughs> and so that that's the downside of giving out unsolicited advice. And um, 
I, I think we we should be more aware of that than we are. I mean, I do think like, you know, people with really high EQ <laughs> don't do it yeah. as much. But um, but, it, you know, it's too bad. And I guess the key lesson that I find interesting from this research I've done with Lauren S. Chris Winkler, a former postdoc at Wharton, um, starting a job as a professor at Kellogg this year, she has found that there's this solution that you can find from advice. And that is giving advice makes you feel really good. When someone asks you for your opinion and your advice, that makes you feel like I'm in the know, I can be useful, I'm a role model. And so um, it's sort of the flip side of, you know, getting that unsolicited advice makes you feel crummy, but having the opportunity to give solicited advice makes you feel great. And it also leads you to, you know, dredge up insights that you might not have thought of otherwise that could be useful to you. And so I think her, her brilliant realization, which I share in the book, is that a way we can help ourselves is actually by um, offering solicited advice to other people who are struggling to achieve the very same goals we're trying to pursue. It will lead us to insights that can help us, and it will boost our confidence that we have what it takes to achieve it. Yeah. Well, I, I think that that makes a perfect segue to talking uh, you know, about this last piece of this, which really struck me, was on conformity. And there was one thing that really struck me in the chapter you wrote on conformity, particularly because I felt that it was so relevant to, you know, a lot of sort of aspirational media content. You said, you know, for social influence to work, there can't be too stark a difference between overachievers and those in need of a boost. If you're hoping to become a faster swimmer, don't start practicing next to Olympic gold medalist Katie Ledecky. Even if you thought to copy and paste her routines, you might sense correctly that the limits of your natural talent would interfere with the benefits of having insight into her training regimen. And, you know, this is something I've said over and over. I said, you know, like I could follow LeBron's training regimen to the letter and I will never make it to the NBA because I'm a scrawny Indian person. Um, (laughs) And the funny thing is that so many of these books that, you know, teach this kind of material use outliers as role models. And so as a result, people end up getting uh, you know, they don't get the results they want. Like I had a mentor who actually was here on the show. He said, you know, people basically overlook the probability that they'll achieve something and focus entirely on the possibility of achieving that goal. And so in the context of that, how do people not fall, you know, victim to social influence, you know, and use solely outliers? I mean, I ended up writing an entire piece titled why outliers are bad role models for most of us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, they're like the media covers them. So they're more um, visible and their stories are very vivid and attractive because they're so dramatic. So there's lots of natural reasons why we love to look at superstars. Um, But yeah, you're you're right that they're they're not the right role models. And my book, well, you know, I mentioned a couple of celebrities at various points because it's kind of fun to have those sprinkled throughout. It's almost all about ordinary people who were able to achieve their goals by using systems that were more effective rather than, you know, Steve Jobs and (laughs) and what he could could accomplish. Because I share your belief that it's the average person um, who, you know, you want to look to like, how did they figure it out? And I guess I would also say, you know, we talked we talked at the beginning of this interview about childhood and (laughs) what what kind of high school student were you i will say i think for me and my research it's always been helpful to remember like i was i was never some kind of rock star you know perfect student um perfect person and the only way i have achieved things is through systems not some incredible gift of genius i you know i have a bad memory i'm like a (laughs) you know decent mathematician but not i wasn't i wasn't capable of getting a PhD in math, let alone probably even an undergraduate degree in math from Princeton. Um, So like understanding your limitations, I think, makes you more sympathetic to others. And and it's always made me attracted to those people who um, achieved probably maybe more than they had the right to achieve and weren't true, uh, like, you know, really right tail outliers on all dimensions. Yeah. Well, it's funny because you may have read uh, this piece. Justine Musk ended up writing a piece called Extreme Success where some kid on Quora has basically asked, hey, how do I become great? Like you know, Richard Branson, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk and Justine uh, ended up luck. being the person to respond. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and Justine happens to be a very good friend of mine. She wrote, you know, the forward to my first book. And I remember her saying she said, you know, I don't want to be all deterministic here, but she's like, I don't think that, you know, the qualities that somebody like an Elon has is something that can be learned. Yeah. And also. It's not so even if you learn them, 
there's just too much luck involved in becoming that extreme of an outlier to think that, uh, yeah. it, it, like Elon Musk, uh, his body double, right, or like his identical twin would have had the same path, uh, mm. plopped down in a in this in a different set of circumstances. That's not how life works. There's just a huge yeah. amount of luck in outliers' paths. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, I feel like I could talk to you all day because this just feels Aww. like a really <laughs> deep rabbit hole, as you know, most of my conversations are with people. Uh, this was but, really fun. Uh, yeah. Well, so I want to finish my final question, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I would say really, really into what they do. And not, maybe I'd use the word passion, but maybe I'd use the word they think it's the most fun thing they could possibly do because we've talked about the power of making something fun, how that leads you to persist longer. And I think what makes people unmistakable is they've found something that is their driving life force that is fun and propels them forward and pro propels them to be creative and unmistakable and remarkable. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your wisdom and your insights with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, your work, the book, and everything else that you're up to? Probably the best place to find me is my website, katiemilkman.com, where you can find information about the book and my podcast, Choiceology, and, um, which is about behavioral science and how it affects our everyday decisions and my research and anything else you might want to know. <laughs> Amazing. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. Acast powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. When I had a boyfriend, did you think that we were sexually active? I sure didn't. I had to be naked. No, completely butt naked. <laughs> well, I had shoes on. Happy Mother's Day. I'm Nikki Levy and welcome to Don't Tell My Mother. Don't Tell My Mother is where celebrities like Adam Rippon, Constance Zimmer, Zainab Johnson, and Emily Hampshire tell true stories they'd never want their moms to know. And then they tell their moms. I would get up early and look at porn. You knew that. Yes. <laughs> You had your diary underneath the pillow. You read my diary? I did. <laughs> Subscribe to Don't Tell My Mother wherever you get your podcasts. If it's not one thing, it's, it's your, your mother. mother. Just don't tell my mother. Just don't, just don't, just don't. ACAST, 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 ACAST recommends. recommends.